Boom. I started the recording. All right. So we'd like to welcome today to the System Science Seminar, uh, Corey Johnson. And he's going to talk about uh, PERSE and systems. Thanks, Andy. And uh, let me just uh, interject that Please. Corey, just for those people who haven't read the announcement, uh, Corey is visiting us from uh, down under. Is that, does that apply to New Zealand as well as It Australia? technically applies to all of Australasia. I see. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you can throw Singapore in there, but not pushing it. <laughs> all, right. all right, so we're very happy to have him visiting us, and uh, he'll uh, broaden our view of systems uh, thinking. Thanks, Martin. And uh, I'll just say thank you once again, uh, especially to Martin, for letting me eavesdrop on his systems philosophy uh, seminar this semester. Um, few, I see a few familiar faces. Uh, it's a great class. I wish philosophy departments themselves had classes like that, but maybe that's a few decades down the line. We'll see that happening. Um, but in any case, the point of my talk today is kind of towards that dream, towards the spirit of um, kind of breaking down these interdisciplinary barriers, um, which lies at the heart of systems ideas to begin with. Um, and the man of the hour is Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, just a show of hands, how many people are familiar with Peirce? <laughs> only because, okay, if it's because of me, it doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, because the only thing I ever talk about is Peirce, so that <laughs> definitely doesn't count. Um, so raise your hands again, besides hearing from me, okay? Like three, okay. So now I don't, now I'm justified. I don't feel bad talking a lot about first. Um, right. So this is the outline. And to start it off, I'll read a quote. Um, since most of you aren't aware of first as a person, um, let alone a philosopher, um, the first thing you might want to know biographically is his best friend for most of his life was the equally important philosopher, in many ways, William James, uh, also American. And late in his life, right at the cusp of before Peirce began dying, essentially, um, he wrote to James, your mind and mine are as little adapted to understanding one another as two minds could possibly be. And therefore, I always feel that I have more to learn from you than anybody. <laughs> I find that absolutely beautiful. <laughs> um, first, definitely um, was, was made public almost single-handedly thanks to William James. Um, and vice versa, William James's philosophy itself is actually riddled with Persian thought. Um, James, throughout his distinguished career, um, constantly references person. If you look at his first pragmatism lecture, he actually says, you know, the, the entire idea of pragmatism itself comes from my friend Charles Peirce. Um, so that's a good way to frame it, thinking about him as a person. As a philosopher, he more or less existed in the 19th century, um, but importantly, that carries over a little bit into the turn of the 20th century, which is a huge turn um, to, to understate it in philosophy. Um, that's the beginning of analytic philosophy. In many ways, that's the beginning of phenomenology and, and continental philosophy, too. Um, so as a lot is happening in the philosophy world, the first decade of the 20th century, person is basically dying, while simultaneously um, creating the most mature form of uh, what I consider is um, systems theoretic thought. Um, so that's the question on the table. Is first important for contemporary systems theory as we are thinking about it? Um, today's answer, yes. You, you might have guessed I would say that. Um, and for three reasons of increasing complexity. And so that should give away how I'm organizing this talk itself. Reason one, on the simplest level, there's a vague structural similarity um, between Persian philosophy at large, which is extremely broad, um, 
qua system viewed as a system itself. And systems theory, um, as I've been presented it and, and my dabbling with it through the last few years, viewed as a system of knowledge too. Um, so that prima facie, you know, at first glance might seem a little awkward to some of you. Um, people who are familiar with some other philosophers such as Karl Popper, um, along with Peirce, you know, strongly believed in this idea of objective knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can immediately ontologize this mass of knowledge that we're all talking about. It, there's nothing suspicious for Peirce and people like Popper to think about systems theory itself as um, kind of an, a piece of ontology. Um, so that would be the first simplistic reason the entire framework of, of Persian thought in a couple slides there. And then the second reason, sec slightly more complex, is there's actually literally active engagement with Perse, either directly or indirectly, and either unknowingly, um, by a myriad of um, either self-proclaimed theorists or people in the constellation of thought that I have labeled as such. Um, systems theorists have labeled them too, so I don't feel too bad about labeling them that, that way. Um, and then lastly, if I have time um, to tie together a story looking back of the evolution of systems thought starting from Peirce, um, which also begins long before him too, um, most importantly in the modern era, Kant and Spinoza. Uh, um, and then taking that continuity that retrograde continuity and trying to slingshot ourselves forward into the future and see if we can continue the, the continuity of this thought. Um, right, and we can also think of these as kind of a closed system view, a finite system view, an open system view, if we want to immediately immerse this in contemporary vocabulary. So that's the plan. Um, <laughs> a very brief, I said brief, which is a lie. Uh, here's an intellectual biography all in one slide of Charles Sanders first. Uh, first thing you might want to know is that he was from the wee little years home educated by America's arguably most renowned mathematician, um, his very own father, Benjamin Peirce. Um, if you've never heard of Benjamin Peirce, basically um, for those of you who have studied linear algebra, um, and almost anything that has to do with algebra. Um, contemporary thought in algebra very much goes back to Benjamin Peirce very often. Um, so that was that was Peirce's in-house feature. Very convenient thing to have. Um, second thing to note, Peirce as a student, like a lot of geniuses, wasn't amazing by any means, um, but he did graduate summa cum laude, um, from Harvard, uh, receiving the first degree of that variety um, in physical chemistry. Um, so very much a scientist in training and spirit, and furthermore, uh, upon graduating and for a large swath of his life, he had a long-term career as a world traveling, which is key, this is huge, to the, to the social aspect of science that Peirce was so obsessed with. Um, but he traveled the world um, in large groups of scientific teams making incredibly precise measurements of um, gravimetric readings, often reading uh, the strength of gravity in various places. Um, he invented an incredible sensitive pendulum um, for making even more precise measurements. Um, but essentially, professionally, he was an experimental physicist. What he considered himself, more than anything else, was a logician, and not a mathematical logician. This is a huge distinction for Peirce. Um, it can cause a lot of problems if you don't keep this in mind. Um, but you know, he thought of his father as a mathematician. He thought of himself as a philosophical logician. And briefly, for about five years, he taught at Johns Hopkins. Um, and in those brief five years, he formed he created all sorts of future logicians that would have substantial um, effects on the coming century of logical thought. Uh, Dewey, also, for those familiar with pragmatist thought, um, John Dewey took classes with person, um, was influenced heavily there. Um, 
Whitehead at one point refers to James as America's Plato and Charles Peirce, who was kind of in the shadows the whole time, as America's Aristotle. Um, so very much um, a philosopher at heart. And these last three, as kind of a mini argument, I like to think these idiosyncratically as kind of the direct sources for Peirce's friends, which I haven't introduced yet, but as a, as a first gloss at them uh, biographically. This, to my mind, are kind of amazing examples of, of why Peirce, as an observer, as an experimentalist, had such amazing access to these otherwise inseparable categories. I mean, these aren't, the categories of Peirce are weird and awkward, and for people that aren't used to the system, um, difficult to separate and into. Um, but Peirce had these clear aspects of his life and experiences um, that really bring out each prominently in their own way. So firstness, for example. Peirce, throughout his life, um, and then about two-thirds of the way through his life, he had um, he documented a mystical experience, actually. Um, but throughout most of his life, he was just enchanted spiritual feelings, which is the best way I can say it. Uh, resulting in a kind of panentheism for those that want labels. Um, but an important thing of Chris's kind of religious thought is he, ultimately, he thinks of God as intrinsically vague. It's not that we're not clear yet or we're permanently agnostic. It's, it's the, the essence of um, what we're getting after is intrinsically vague to begin with. It's undifferentiated. It's firstness. Um, so Chris's life is, is full of firstness from the get-go. Um, and secondly, something that was not diagnosed during his life, we, we didn't have the science yet, but he suffered from trigeminal neuralgia, which is basically lightning strikes to your that ran. It's documented to be one of the most painful conditions known to man. <laughs> so for me, that's, that's a clear sign of the amazing access to secondness. Secondness is all about getting hit and hitting. <laughs> um, what, when Peirce writes to James, he, his whole problem with Hegelianism, with Hegel, is he thinks Hegel is completely missing secondness. He writes to James and says, Hegel has no idea what it's like to be hit. And meanwhile, <laughs> Peirce is having lightning strikes to his face. Um, that he does come out in public and give talks. Um, he, he was known for having these kind of uh, unanticipated explosive uh, forms of behavior, and, you know, we can largely attribute it to this awful condition that he suffered from. Um, and then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, in 1859, so when Paris is turning 20, which for most of us is the apex of life, Darwin publishes, Darwin publishes The Origin of Species, and so that's the height of Paris's youth in the entire intellectual world, including the anti-intellectual community of Americans uh, at large, are just infected with evolutionary thought. Um, so Peirce gets hit evolution at a prime time. Um, uh, so speaking of the age of 20, that's in his youth when he, he was relatively handsome, if I do say so myself. Um, and just as the last quote, and then I'll carry on, uh, during his brief stint at Johns Hopkins, this is how one of his students, um, who didn't become famous, I've never heard of William Montague, um, but this is what he said. For Peirce himself, I had a kind of worship. While his intellect was cold and clear, his metaphysical imagination was capricious, scintillating, and unbridled, and his whole personality was so rich and mysterious that he seemed a being apart, a superman. I would rather have been like him than any other person I had ever met. If that's not a compliment, I don't know what a compliment is. <laughs> uh, so, okay, quick infographic, because I'm obsessed with these things too, some data visualization. Uh, I didn't cite this at all. This actually comes from uh, a blog. I tell you who made this one. This comes from the IEP, the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, not the SEP, which is severely biased towards analytic philosophy. The nice thing about IEP is it's fairly neutral in terms of various social traditions in, in contemporary philosophy or, sorry, trans-historical philosophy. Um, so this is cut off. This, this infographic is nice because over here, 
there's this ray that shoots out of nowhere, which is East Asian thought. You've got so Confucius is here basically, um, and then you've got medieval philosophy, uh, ancient philosophy. Your purples more or less the analytic tradition. Your greens more or less the continental tradition. And the one thing I really want to point out, which really puts us in the proper place of where we should be thinking, and what I love so much about this infographic, um, is where Hearst is. Hearst is not only on the fringe, but he's precisely on the boundary of our two so-called traditions in contemporary philosophy. Um, which, as him being the go-to representative of the pragmatist tradition slash processist tradition that I want to be emphasizing today, um, is precisely right. Because the, the gist of process philosophy is this productive fusion of the two kind of attractors of, um, I'm stealing this analogy from Martin right now, but I like it so much. Um, the two kind of attractors of our two traditions. It, the attractor for analytic philosophy is essentially logic, more or less, in, in various ways. And um, some kind of serious work into phenomenology on the continental mm -hmm. side. And for people like Hearst, the later Wittgenstein, uh, Wilfred Sellers, who I'll mention later too, uh, we've got Whitehead's here, he should be higher up. Um, <laughs> Dewey has a process metaphysics, and then James is right next to Hearst. So this whole swath, um, and I kind of like to think if you zoom in very closely, you know, Hearst and um, Sellers would be half and half, or have some kind of multicolored fractal nature. Um, <laughs> but so that's a way to orient ourselves. You talked about uh, Dewey's uh, philosophy as coming more from a psychology, from a, trying to understand his philosophy from a psychological context, right? He did. That's what first critiqued him on later in life, yeah. But uh, you, uh, do scholars talk about the social context? Because I always felt that uh, 19th century American society and pragmatism goes together. So do people talk about whether American society influence was the genesis of pragmatism or not? There or, is, or I'm not, I, I, that definitely is a sub-literature. I'm not super familiar with it. Uh, one interesting thing I noticed, though, that you, might interest you, is that um, basically the birth, birth of progressivism, mm. um, that was progressive, American progressivism as we know it, happened in the eight, early 1880s at Johns Hopkins University. Oh, that's where Peirce was teaching. I don't think that's a coincidence. Okay. Um, but yeah. Anyways, these are like extreme extrapolations that I like to think about. Um, so this previous slide, this <laughs> is. Uh, I love how cognitive science. You know, all it takes is a hexagon to have financial and bureaucratic unity. <laughs> um, but whoever came up with it decided to make it a hexagon. Um, and first, each um, side of the hexagon is completely riddled with, with Persian thought, and you've got people from each discipline um, claiming, uh, an AI, for example, you have computer scientists saying Persians are a revered intellectual ancestor, and anthropology, you have people saying Pers should be recognized as a founding father. And then you've got Chomsky saying later on in his life, I'm almost paraphrasing Charles Sanders first, describing his entire career. Um, and also what's often hidden in philosophy of mind too, the whole vocabulary of contemporary academic philosophy of mind talks about qualia and types and tokens. And you can't write an article or, or read an article that doesn't use these terms. That's the, the fixed vocabulary right now. That all comes from Peirce, um, but no Peirce. It's just that his language is, is alive and it was soaked up through the decades. Um, so anyways, <laughs> let's just keep this in mind. And I'll try to come up with something for system science um, and Peirce later on. So just as a comparison. Um, right, so the categories, most importantly. How are we doing in time? Einstein quote, thinking without depositing stories.
it would be as impossible as this breathing in a vacuum. <laughs> Thank you, Einstein. Um, so that's to motivate why we're even bothering to go this abstract. This stuff is amazingly awkward and abstract. Um, but hopefully the more you appreciate it and try to appreciate it, the more um, important it may sound. Um, just a little key here. I'll have a one-line description of each of person's categories, and then I'll have various bracketed things beneath them. Square brackets refer to Kantian categories, which is, in some sense, the source of Peirce's categories. Peirce's categories come precisely from Peirce looking at Kant's categories and abstracting from them themselves, and finding, for him, even deeper categories. Um, or back he was a, it's a fake name, it's a pseudonym for a group of French mathematicians um, that discovered fundamental structures, categories in math. Um, so that's my own attributing. Anytime you use a question mark, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's an idiosyncratic item. And then I have my own terms as well. So firstness. Firstness is abstract, absolute character. Um, so think in philosophy of mind, people like David Chalmers, he talks about the character of consciousness. He doesn't care about its functional aspect or all these other things. He cares about the experiential character of consciousness. He doesn't really engage with person thought directly, but what he's going after is really he wants person persons. He doesn't realize it, but that's what he wants. Um, so that's firstness in the nutshell. It's, it also is representative of independence, pure independence, and variety and origination. Um, they, in some sense, come from these person categories. Um, mathematically, algebraic structures line up nicely, I believe, and we can think of it as a kind of disorder, um, but in a global sense. Secondness, like I referred to earlier, what Hegel is often missing, it's being hit, it involves determinate brute, blind interactions from the world, external world. Um, this involves dependence, resistance. Uh, one very memorable example, has all these beautiful examples of each of his categories, but one example he uses often is the feeling of a sheriff's arm on your shoulder, which probably happened to first at some point in his life, you know, right before he was arrested for you know, public nuisance or something. Corey, is, uh, isn't Hegel's uh, negation kind of like that? Yeah, determinate negation. Yeah. And some contemporary philosophers like Robert Brandom, um, who's a bit of a pragmatist, does talk about it. So I do think Peirce's criticism was pretty extreme of Hegel. He doesn't, I agree, I think there is some secondness in Hegel. Um, but kind of like your uh, kind of diagnosing of metaphysical problems that, that you talk about in, in the seminar, um, with versus categories, he thinks that each should be equally prominent in our thoughts, and we should strive to that ideal, um, because reality itself each of the categories are equally prominent. And if not, then we have kind of this metaphysical problem. Um, and so his overall analysis, first thing he hated about Hegel is um, Hegel was an awful mathematician. <laughs> so, it's kind of unfair criticism. There were plenty of important philosophers that weren't as mathematically sophisticated as first. Um, and then secondly, yeah, he thought secondness, he thought there was a, a diagnosis there, that secondness wasn't strong enough for Hegel. Um, but there definitely is secondness. Peirce is a bit too unfair with Hegel. Um, right. Uh, so compulsion, compulsive experience, talk, uh, Peirce talks about for secondness. And then thirdness is imminent growth of generality. Um, that perhaps sounds the most foreign and strange and, and difficult around. It's, I believe, in one four sentence, uh, four word sentence, the best capturing of thirdness. It's imminent, which is to say, not transcendent. 
in the history of philosophy, people that weren't nominalists, which is to say realists about universals and these things, were realists, but were really realists, were, were these absolutist realists that believed in kind of transcendent universals. Um, and of course, that spills over into religious thought as well, um, in the theologians of the medieval age. But for Peirce, thirdness is, is imminent. It's in reality itself. And it's generality, too. And it's, it's growing generality. For Peirce, generality doesn't make sense unless it's generalization, unless it's process, unless it's constantly growing in a continuous manner. Uh, and then topology is kind of the mathematical uh, which was also the birth of topology coincides with, with Percy's timeline as well, which was a huge uh, influence. Great. Yeah. You've got the word uh, independence in both firstness. Uh, interdependence. Oh, interdependence, sorry. Yeah, I yeah. See that, right, okay, well, I'm glad to <laughs> see if you can point that out. Yeah. Yeah, okay. um, but that's still a good observation. Peirce doesn't use interdependence. Um, he very much uses habit and control, uh, especially self-control. Um, so you can already see the cybernetic vocabulary spilling into thirdness itself. Um, habituation, self-control. Okay, so for people that don't speak this language, which is perhaps most of us, um, including me still, here's a nice little metaphysical thesaurus. Find your favorite philosopher and, and try to try to link them up. Remember, once again, question marks mean either my own assertion slash not a perfect fit. Um, if we go all the way back to Taoist philosophy, we've got Zhuangzi with Taoist cosmology, Taiji, Yin Yang, and Qi, loosely firstness and thirdness. We, th we can think about Aristotelian uh, forms of causation, formal cause, efficient cause, Final cause, and final cause being more of a Kantian <coughs> final cause, this kind of inner teleology, um, purposiveness without a purpose. That's how philosophers like to talk. <laughs> um, Spinoza is infinitely pluralistic attributes and finite modes, infinite modes. That lines up quite nicely with Persian categories. Um, Notice I, I leave out substance. Substance is kind of, first has a notion of zeroness too, and I like to think of substance as zeroness, but I won't get into that. Um, Whitehead, there's a parallel to there, but Whitehead, of course, has to use really strange words. Um, so unless you're familiar with those, ignore Whitehead. Um, Rene Tome, um, mathematician, for those of you familiar with Tome, He's got these kind of categories of pregnancy, salience, and concept, which I think line up quite nicely. Um, and then Deleuze, who's um, an interesting philosopher, he uses, for, for system science itself, it's interesting because he uses the vocabulary of thermodynamics, dynamical systems, um, and all the other vocabulary he uses. Um, but he's also heavily influenced by Bergson, for example, which he was a contemporary person and wrote about creative evolution, and Bergsonism kind of evolved into post here and there. Um, so Deleuze has a bit of that, um, but he also has a huge Spinozan and, and Persian influence. Peirce directly through and then um, Spinoza through um, a lot of stuff. Spinoza is his favorite philosopher. Um, and so those are his categories. All right, moving right along. That's Peirce's poetry on what firstness is. Um, <laughs> right. So, okay, here's the similarity. So, Peirce's program at large, he's continuing the Kantian, uh, and there's a mathematician around Kant's time called Lambert, um, who's not talked about enough, um, but they have this idea of an architectonic system. Um, and so it's, it's the system mentality, but applied to knowledge, the structure of knowledge itself. Um, so we want to use the categories to structure the environment of knowledge. Um, and in the early days of um, quote unquote general systems theory, saw a similar program, and we get things like Kenneth Boulding saying general systems theory is model building, which lies somewhere between pure mathematics and the specialized disciplines, which he means science at large. Um, 
that's nice because now we have two interlocking features which really hone in on this itonic similarity. Uh, we have this vague categorical harmony um, by the insistence of triadicity. Uh, the triadic relation, I believe, um, is really lies at the core of systems thought, and of course it lies at the core of Persian thought. Um, without thirdness, the entire system falls apart for Perse. Um, and then furthermore, a sympathy with the, the locus, the exact location of where this, this metaphysics would be. Um, and now, the key about Perse's architectonic system for us is that these, these are interlocking. These two features are connected, which is precisely because the categories themselves structure knowledge. So the location that we find systems at is going to be dictated in some sense by the three categories. Um, so this is it, all in one slide. <laughs> There's there, at one point in person's life, you know, it goes all the way down to practical arts. Um, but I, I spared you from the practical arts. Um, <laughs> but this does start at the highest level, which is to say pure mathematics. And that would be representative of firstness. Um, followed by philosophy as secondness, which is to say one capturing, according to Peirce, is it's a positive inquiry of familiar phenomena, everyday phenomena. That's why Peirce was convinced that philosophers very much have it easy. You know, very much the man off the street is a philosopher, you know, if he cares about the stuff he's seeing all the time. Um, it takes, to do science, it takes equipment, a lot of complex things. <laughs> and mathematics is even easier than philosophy in some sense because you literally don't need anything. You don't even need the, you know, the external compulsion of the world because it's, it's all about this um, firstness and this hypothetical, uh, hypothetical object. Um, okay, so these are the three subcategories of philosophy itself. And so the way this works is now we've got this numbering system, a nesting phenomenon where we can have internal categorical layers of each category. Um, and so this goes straight towards the fractal nature that lies um, beneath the person's thought, which also has, as we'll see, strong parallels with systems thought at large. Um, I like, for those of you familiar with Wilfred Sellers, he, um, besides Peirce, I consider him in the past 200 years to be one of the most important um, philosophers. He had these kind of images of man in the world. Sellers very much is all about saving the appearances, um, very much about the everyday familiar phenomena. Um, and he's got this notion of the original image, the manifest image, and the scientific image. Um, but I won't go into detail there. If you're familiar with them, that might help. Um, and then I nicked this. These are, I believe, only Martin's terms. I don't know if this kind of comes from Spencer Brown in a way, right? Um, but those kind of systems theoretic categories, <coughs> I believe, line up quite nicely, too. So there's a vague similarity we have there as well. And once again, these are the attractors of continental thought, loosely understood analytic thought and um, what we're thinking of this process or pragmatist thought. I, I struggle, I don't always want to say pragmatist to be fair to Peirce. For Peirce, pragmatism or what he later called pragmat, uh, pragmaticism to make it the word ugly enough to be safe from kidnappers. Um, but he changed the word because James uh, which makes sense, too, because all thought and ideas generalize and grow at first. So he knew if this, he birthed this idea, he knew it was going to be generalized and analogized to all new heights that it shouldn't be. Uh, for Peirce, prag pragmaticism is just a logical principle, but it interfaces with metaphysics. So before we even get to metaphysics, um, we're using this kind of pragmaticism uh, 
doctrine, which I won't go into either. If you're familiar with pragmatism, this is the heart. That's the location of pragmatism for Peirce. Um, and this 2.2.3 is the location of uh, Persian semiotics. And so some examples now of contemporary. That's Peirce's example during his lifetime. As a contemporary example, I find this quite nice. Um, this is about the cytoskeleton um, and, and, and cell wall construction generation. So the cells that are forming the sheet continuously make new branches, which is, which is thirdness in action of their cytoskeleton network. These branches head towards random points in the cell periphery. Those that do not happen to land on a junction will never experience mechanical force, whereas those filaments that do find a link to a junction will be placed under tension. So this mechanical force, this tension, is precisely secondness. Um, and notice that it's blind, too. Like, literally, the one thing I love about this example is the force is coming from the neighboring cells that are utterly external to the, the interiority of, of each cell. Um, and now it happens that cells are full of enzyme complexes, which is it's this kind of firstness that rapidly destroy the cytoskeleton filaments. Um, this destruction is, however, strongly inhibited if the filament is under mechanical load. Um, and then this whole adaptive self organization gives rise to um, cell walls as we know them. But I, I, I like this as a nice uh, succinct demonstration of, of how the categories are completely interdependent. You can never, if you push hard enough, you can never find one by itself, um, which is key. So firstness, for example, if, if people like Chalmers really thinks he can know enough to reach some pure state of the character of experience, um, then if he's following person thought, um, he should give up because it's just an abstraction. Firstness is always there as, um, as, a, as a simple aspect of an otherwise complex um, system. So it can be, person's word is prescinding. It can be abstracted from experience, um, from sensation, but we can't, literally experience it in full. Um, so some active engagement. Um, Varela, who some of you may be familiar with, with his auto-poetic theory, um, and then Gregory Bateson, um, and a few others, Magnani and Piazza, for example, they either unknowingly or knowingly are currently interacting and engaging with, with these person ideas very strongly. Um, Rolla, for example, he has, he has one short article on uh, a logical calculus for self-reference, which is supposed to be capturing, um, he thinks it's, it's the logical foundation for uh, cybernetic thought to some extent. Uh, and that comes from Spencer Brown. Um, Spencer Brown's logic, though, is actually, it's not only a reinvention um, of Peirce's, I do say so myself, much more elegant uh, entitative graphs, um, but it's also just one fragment, the whole system. So the last decade of Peirce's life while he was dying, he was working on these graphs, and he took it all the way up to the level of modalities. Uh, which is to say possibility and necessity and actuality. And the big difference with Peirce, just in a picture, Spencer Brown providing a logical foundation for cybernetics was all on the board, on one plane, on one sheet of assertion, Peirce would say. So Peirce's graphs essentially turned that whole sheet into a book of sheets um, that have interesting connections between them um, via this, this modal thinking, this, this systems thinking. Um, 
so there's there's kind of an indirect and, and uh, unbeknownst to Barella to some degree connection there um, that I myself personally am pursuing uh, in my own work. Uh, but then Bateson and Magnani and Piazza they talk about um, other kinds of inferences such as abduction, which is which is an idea of first that he gets from Aristotle. Um, Peirce really, really insisted that abduction laid at the bottom of all scientific reasoning. Um, that we can't, we can't even make inductions or deductions um, without this interdependent abductive process. And, and abduction, in a nutshell, is um, kind of at the the trimet station on the glass, you've got these the, the half-formed squares. But if you stare at it, you, all of us think, "Oh, there's a square there." Um, but it's just these these half-formed squares. Um, that when we do that, when we're all waiting for the train at the station, uh, we're, we're instantaneously making abductions. Uh, people like Chomsky even think that 50,000 years ago. There was there's some magical moment in evolution where humans we actually tap into abduction for the first time and then our abstract thought took off. For Chomsky, that was the birth of us being able to do mathematics. Uh, I'm not quite Chomsky. I don't that's I don't even know if the data is there for him to say that. But yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking of abduction in terms of like just thought. Is that, is that sort of yeah sort of construct? Like, yeah, I think just thought thought is very much. Um, a part of that, yeah, and um, yeah, definitely. Um, so people are are Bateson's interacting with that, which is directly with Persian thought. Uh, he even talks about double description, which is basically using abduction and induction at the same time, to kind of triangulate on on what we're trying to understand. And uh, interesting, these guys take off from this work too, and they even talk about kind of this conclusion of abduction being a, a creation of a new attractor. Um, so they even they put it all in, in dynamical systems language, which is interesting. I'll just leave that as I can talk about it later if um, people are interested. Um, so the guy I, I want to focus on mostly, though, is, is Stuart Hoffman, um, specifically his investigations um, from 2000. And he, uh, I'm calling his interaction with first flirtations and indirect, um, because he has these fleeting moments, um, especially in this work, where he sees the, the possible huge productivity of, of engaging with um, semiotics, essentially, um, but doesn't fully yet grasp it. Um, and that may be for many reasons. Um, but if you remember back from our architectonic system, This is important for many reasons. I didn't highlight this enough. Nope. So this is semiotic thought in general. And not only does it interface with metaphysics or, or systems theory as we're thinking about it, um, but it's also the thirdness of the secondness that comes before it. So it's, it's very much, first talks about a mirror in the system often. About logic itself being a mirror of ethical behavior. Um, so there's this kind of mirroring. It's a weak isomorphism. That, uh, um, none of what I'm saying right now is rigorous. But this is super important, because not only does this interface with metaphysics, but it's a thirdness of the prior category. Mm -hmm. um, so all of all the structure um, built into semi semiotic thought can in some robust sense be lifted into metaphysics itself. Now, some people, just like the pragmatists, got carried away with pragmatism, and they blew it up to the whole philosophy, to a whole social tradition. For first looks, it's actually it's within three layers of nesting. It's a very, very particular area of all of thought. It's just a logical principle. And then semiotics itself is quite narrow. There are people nowadays that want to apply semiotics to all of what we can do and know. Um, that would be overgeneralizing first, too. If you want to be authentic to 
to Purse's system here, you know, semiotic is, is, is nice. It can give us a lot, a really rich framework to work with. Um, and because of this relationship, interfacing plus being thirdness of the prior category and this being thirdness will give us a strong parallel. Um, but that's not to say that, for example, as a slogan, metaphysics is semiotics. People say that. People write that in journals. If, if you want to be fair to Peirce, that, that would be the wrong move to make. Um, but in any case, the biggest interfacing that I just want to highlight is biosemiotics. Um, semiotics, as it's been absorbed through the past half century, has had all sorts of pre uh, <laughs> It's never ending. Uh, I think the one that anyone should really take seriously and care about is biosemiotics, which was first, well, biosemiotics. And in some sense, it goes back to, um, does anyone speak German? Oops, cool. Uh, I can't pronounce his name. But he was a Kantian biologist, and he didn't directly engage with Peirce. Uh, but since he engaged with Kant, that there's an indirect parallel there, um, since Peirce was very much a Kantian himself. Um, but he had a, a kind of semiotics, and it's taken to all new heights by these guys. And Kaufman is really wanting this in his kind of general biology that he's designing in, in investigation. And that's your interpretation, that Kaufman is borrowing from Sebok and... Uh, no, those are just contemporary names, but this is, he's directly thinking about Peirce, such as in this quote here. Um, he says, once there's an autonomous agent, there's a semantics from its privileged point of view, and the incoming molecule is either yuck or yum, not far from C.S. Peirce's meaning-laden semiotic triad. Um, so he, he, he wants it, and he's thinking about it. Um, but I mean, once again, semiotics has been moved in all the wrong directions. It's, um, it's not always clear to people how to engage with it in, in, in a good way without being misled um, by the overgeneralizers. Um, you earlier said that uh, some uh, people think uh, metaphysics is all of, is only about the semiotic. Can you name a tradition? I'm just curious. Um, it's not yet a tradition. Some of them probably want it to be a tradition. Um, but there's a whole constellation of people right now um, that are overgeneralizing semiotics. Just like the pragmatists, the American pragmatists, especially overgeneralized pragmatism. They've applied it to social life and politics and everything. Um, whereas for Peirce, it was such a small fragment of um, this thought. It's important, but at the end of the day, it's just a logical principle. Um, it's a method of right thinking for Peirce. Um, that we should always focus on practical effects and consequences. Um, so I guess the one in, in Kaufman's preface, I'm not managing my time well, but he says this, he says, he argues against the assumption of traditional science. He says traditional science at large, or Newtonian, the Newtonian paradigm, if you will, um, that we are able to state ahead of time what the full space of possibilities is, which is to say the, the phase space, the state space, the configuration space. We can say it and, and finitely, even if we can't list it, we have a finite algorithm. We have something of, of finitude um, that gives us our configuration space of possibilities. And Kaufman's one nugget of a thought that opens up this whole book, um, which is quite good. I, I, I think the book is really important. But it is this, that we often can't do that, especially when it comes to life itself. The um, Kaufman talks about the adjacent possible. That's firstness. He's, he's embracing firstness. When, when Kaufman isolates and talks about the adjacent possible, that's a variety, that's a manifestation of firsting firstness, very much. Uh, I, I feel confident saying that. Um, so this echoes the firsting key idea of, of generative potential of firstness. Because for Peirce, if you think of a mathematician, for example, when we consciously observe or experiment upon a diet, we, we find invariably, uh, especially if you're a good mathematician, you invariably find new hidden, previously hidden relations. And I'm highlighting diagram, for, this notion of a diagram for Peirce is huge. This cannot be overgeneralized. This idea can really much structure all of Peirce's thought. 
because the diagram is representative of firstness, which is to say, another way to try to think about firstness is it's, it's thirdness and secondness taken together before they're differentiated. But right? firstness has to have the potential for both secondness and thirdness, but it can't differentiate them because otherwise we'd be using secondness. Right? So firstness is, in some loose sense, thirdness and secondness at the same time. And a diagram is iconic of exactly that. Because, and this is a problem in philosophy and mathematics all the time. Like, if we work on a diagram, if you work in geometry and you have a triangle in front of you, first of all, the philosopher said, what do you mean you have a triangle in front of you? <laughs> well, okay, I drew a triangle. <laughs> I drew, like, not a scalene, really squiggly triangle in front of me. I'm trying to work with it, you know? Like, shut up, teacher. <laughs> um, and so Burgess' response, he takes it seriously, and he thinks the only way we can actually even do mathematics, the way we can solve this problem, is to embrace firstness and think about a diagram as it's an external manifestation of firstness. Because once again, we always need every category. We always need to start with thirdness and then penetrate in via abstraction to get to other layers. So we need to externalize it. We need to be able to manipulate it physically. Um, but the diagram itself is both, it's representative of both thirdness and secondness. Because the triangle you draw on your page has to be this is why mathematicians write all the time. Without loss of generality, <laughs> this phrase in mathematics, which is rampant, that phrase <laughs> is basically cursing firstness in action. Because you need to instantiate something to work with it. So you need to have secondness. But you also need to have thirdness, because you don't want to be instantiating something and then losing the generality of that the mathematician is going after. Um, so this diagram is a manifestation of firstness which is to say this kind of fusion of thirdness and secondness at the same time. And part of the diagram itself is this, is this key notion of, of a generated potential. Whenever you have a diagram, um, you have hidden relations. So for example, this goes all the way back to ancient philosophy. In, in Plato's Mino, he talks about Socrates and the slave boy. And the slave boy has to solve this problem. He's, he's not given this inner square with the diagonals first. He's just given the outer square, and his task is to double this bottom left square. That's what Socrates asked the slave boy, and the slave boy's like, I don't know. And then he stares at the diagram. He observes it as firstness, and then he sees manifesting these diagonals, which conveniently form, if you check out the area, you know, twice, twice the area of, of the bottom left one. Um, so this, this manipulation of the diagrams is, is iconic of uh, firstness in action. And to me, as a, as a slogan, since we're running out of time, this is largely what Kaufman is, is wanting and going after. So there's a huge potential for interaction um, here, for this, this idea of a general biology and, and, and the, the systems theory philosophy underlying it. Um, and I think engaging with all of Purse's system can really um, increase the richness of that. Um, should I leave time for? Should, yeah. OK. Um, because we can end there. The last slogan I can end with, I guess, is when we think, if, when we add in thirdness, the interdependence the, the richness that we get is that firstness, although it's an abstraction, although we have to do all this work to get there, and although we can't ever directly engage with it, the reason why we need it in our thought and philosophy is from the perspective of thirdness itself, which is to say from the perspective of process, from the perspective of evolution, from the perspective of dynamics, firstness can explain secondness, can explain the instantiations, the concrete phenomena that we meet with, um, which are always new, because they're just tokens. They're just finite modes in first Spinoza. Um, but the reason why we need firstness, which is, in first is architectonic, essentially that's saying the reason why we need mathematics, pure mathematics, is because pure mathematics has the potential to explain um, our secondnesses. Um, and but that's only from the perspective of thirdness. Thirdness is the only category that gives us that vantage point, because it gives us um, continuity. It gives us growth from firstness to secondness. Um, 
And that's kind of backtracking, first in thought. And for those of you, I don't know how many, I know um, <laughs> Nick, you're interested in category theory a bit, just as just a fleeting kind of a really awful promissory note I can leave you is that what I'm currently very interested in is how now in contemporary mathematics, um, not only is mathematics becoming diagrammatized, diagrams are becoming more and more accepted. It, people like Borbaki killed the visual, killed the pictorial a century ago, thinking that we need all this kind of linguistic, essentially rigorous and precise, but still linguistic language doing our math. And now we're seeing a renaissance of, of diagrams themselves, most notably in category theory. And what I'm noticing, of course, what I'm noticing, what else would I notice? I'm noticing the categories presenting themselves, which is to say Peirce's categories, where we have objects um, as firstnesses and arrows um, as secondness. And then we have this idea of a universal property in category theory or these mediating morphisms, which are, for me, the diagrammatic representation of, of clearness and action. Um, now, people in neuroscience, I know, are starting to get in category theory. Biology, not so much, but I think if the biology world embraces it more, um, that there could be huge potential for growth there. Um, okay, so then for financial and bureaucratic unity of system science, I had a hexagon. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we can't tell the cognitive scientists that I made this. but. Um, I probably have my chosen six wrong, um, but from my experience in, in Martin's awesome class, I've kind of picked these out. Systems theory, you know, that's our philosophical correlate at the top. But then biology, biocentric, we can't get away without biology. Cybernetics for sure, thermodynamics, ecology slash economics to some degree, and um, maybe catastrophe theory and chaos theory. And um, Here's my list of, of Peirce's influence and to be influence um, of the system science hexagon at large. In terms of general systems theory, Peirce's novel notion of universal phenomena captures both at the same time this idea of ubiquity of systems and fractality. And in biology, one thing Peirce basically did is he transformed physics itself into a biological science. And the best way I can explain that to you is this one quote right here. The only possible way of accounting for the laws of nature, which for him, he's thinking physical laws of nature, is to suppose them results of evolution themselves. Hmm. Only now, people like Lee Smolin and a couple other um, cosmologists are starting to embrace this idea. Um, but first took this idea very seriously. Um, and it comes from a lifelong meditation on the importance of um, is architectonic. Um, but basically, in this one sentence, this one philosophical thesis, what this says is physics is a lot like, physics is basically biology after all. Um, so this one sentence transforms physics as we know it as a discipline into in a biocentric discipline. Um, so that's huge. If that means anything, then first has a definite role to play in biology as we know it. Cybernetics, this is very direct. First is Self-correcting logic of science. So induction itself, this is the imminence for first. Induction itself corrects itself inductively. Just think of Newton's method in, in trying to come up with a numerical value. You know, induction, through induction, another layer of induction, and then a layer on top of that can correct itself. Um, so this is the very notion of feedback, um, which is not a coincidence by any means. Wiener um, did his PhD on Peirce's logic. Um, so that's where that comes from. Thermodynamics, Peirce, for all I know, in philosophy at large, was pretty much the first philosopher to take really seriously this idea of the long run, and the law of large numbers, and these other robustly thermodynamic uh, concepts. And he injected that. There's a whole subdiscipline of academic philosophy now called the philosophy of statistics that revolves around these person ideas, um, and therefore from dynamics. Um, ecology thirdness, which I didn't have previously in talking about it, but 
first often says thermos is complexification or diversification, either way. So it's not just growth. Generalizing itself is mm -hmm. diversification. Um, so this has huge ecological implications if we, if we take that seriously. Um, and then catastrophe theory, the reason why I think Tome is important, and by the way, Renaud Tome thinks he's the first philosopher of the continuum since Aristotle. He's not. He forgot about Peirce. Um, <laughs> Peirce actually took the continuum even more seriously than Tome. Um, and one thing you notice for Peirce, he didn't come up with catastrophe theory, but he did pinpoint the mathematical correlate of metaphysics itself in topology, which was beginning during his time. Um, so metaphysics, as a systems metaphysics, as a, as a good, pragmatic, philosophical metaphysics, um, ought to be anchored in mathematical topology, which is to say continuity and, and the dynamics of forms. Okay, references. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. We should, we should wrap up. Yes. And, uh, Is it only the adjacent possible that's firstness, or is it the possible? Is, so the possible, Kaufman talks about it like that. Well, so the, possible, the possible, I mean, is the adjacent possible, like mm. you have organisms, what, what mutations in the present genome might then might then break right. into actual. Right. But there's the possible more broadly. Right, know, that's right. Yeah. So we're distant Thanks, from Nick. adjacent. So is the possible in general firstness, or is it only the possible that somehow is nearby or related to the potential or somehow yeah. close to the actual? That's right, yeah. Your thought is right. The possible itself, the infinitely uh, potential possible, that's firstness. And then the adjacent possible, that would highlight, that would pinpoint this kind of the generative potential built in to possibility. Right, so the possible writ large, which, which is to say not finitely stable, is very much firstness. And I've got this phenomenology for Mental Friends who talks about the lose is virtual. Right. He says it's not exactly the same as well this is as the potential or the possible, but it's similar. I'm happy you asked that because this is a perfect example of how useful and how we can read off thousands of research projects from versus architectonic because Deleuze yeah, he talks about virtuality, the virtual, as being um, as being real but not actual, ideal but not abstract. He's using all this language, which is nice. He's trying, but a better way to think about it is to think to locate it in our tectonic because he doesn't want to make it pure possibility. Because that would abstract it too much. That would that would remove it from metaphysics itself. He'd be talking about phenomenology or something. But he doesn't. He's Deleuze considers himself a pure metaphysician. So he wants to be doing metaphysics. So the virtual, he doesn't want it to be the phenomenological possible, just pure possibility. And definitely not the possibility of the mathematician. He wants it to be metaphysical possibility. The metaphysical possibility is already in thirdness. It's already imminent reality. So it already has to embody growth itself. It can't just be kind of dormant possibility or this kind of static possibility that harbors and, and more abstract thought. It's got, he wants it to be much more concretized. Um, so basically he's using all this loop. He's trying to say it's, it basically lies in this realm. It's like a firstness 
of metaphysics, which is his own thirdness. Um, I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andy. How long did you dwell in this realm before you got it? <laughs> it uh, probably. Well, I've been reading first for a decade now, um, and I obviously, I obviously still don't have it. So it probably takes um, a lifetime to get. There are three reasons why, why getting in the purse is difficult. Um, a, his own character. His whole life is just one big mistake and, and series of awful events. Um, Second mistake. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. And, uh, you know, that's a metaphysical problem. Way too much secondness. It's like the anti hegel And... Um, Secondly, the editorship, when people at Harvard first had the first manuscripts, um, the first editors were awful. They had no system about organizing the otherwise kind of scattered um, papers. So that really turned people off until the 1950s. It wasn't until the 50s and 60s where you get um, people that actually ended up becoming very important and prominent philosophers engaging with it again, such as Hillary Putnam and um, Klein and uh, all those big big names. Um, but so there's a whole, but the nice thing is Purse was roughly a century ahead of his time. So it's good that we're like only now there's kind of a community and people are starting to, to, to really engage with it um, because he was uh, so much ahead of his time. And a lot of that also has to do, he, you know, wasn't necessarily a, just a prodigal genius. Um, his training at home with his father, his father refused to discipline him at all. He basically, you know, the, the, the teaching, imagine being taught that. Not enough secondness gives rise to too much secondness. Right, right. So he's got, he's got all this firstness at home. Exactly. This is a perfect uh, diagnosis according to Martin's uh, methodology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if if purse is your hammer or whatever, and every time you look at a philosopher you're using, are there philosophers that just don't make any sense to you at all from this point? Can't be cracked by the person hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, in many ways, so nominalist philosophers, which is to say, like philosophers that truncate after secondness that don't take thirdness seriously, um, you can't line them up in any intelligible way with Persian thought because thirdness is just not around. It's not accepted. It's not. It's seen as spooky. Um, and that's somewhat understandable when it's taken to be transcendental. People thought if it's imminent, if it's, if it's in reality itself as um, feedback, then um, it's more palatable. And um, so people... Modern philosophy itself is riddled with dualism. Basically, the later pragmatists, not only first, but Dewey and Rorty, who kind of went his own postmodern way, but the early Rorty and Dewey, they are often said to be philosophers that just shoot down dualism. And that's a nice, it's a slogan, which is always wrong, but it's a nice way to think about uh, what pragmatism and, and process thought does, because if you have a dualistic philosophy, then you're, you're, you're missing something, and you're not going to be able to line it up with triadic thought. Yeah. Isn't, isn't, this, isn't this struggle that um, the philosopher having a thirdness kind of similar to like a larger intellectual struggle with emergence? Like the idea that either, like there's this idea in early emergentism that, oh, like it's mystical property that, you know, that comes in with that or something that makes this thing essentially different from, you know, the components of that thing that you're at. But then so now we have like mathematical models that show actually just the just the sequence of interactions and that like structure in itself give rise to that new emergent property that just seemingly mystical before and more like that speaks to that. Definitely so, definitely, so. definitely, yeah. Um, and also it's it's not we shouldn't like criticize the 
basically the pre-topology guys too much because it wasn't until it crystallized mathematically as topology, which is to say the continuum, that we could, like we had a framework to base this idea of thirdness on. Um, because before the birth of topology, people were like, well, exactly what you just said. I mean, how are we getting these new properties? We just have these kind of isolated points. It's a Humean philosophy. For Hume, Hume couldn't understand causation, therefore he said we don't have causation. <laughs> and he said it because everything he looked in his mind, he just sat being, you know, a very rotund Scottish man. And uh, he's just like, oh yeah, here's the thought, here's the thought, here's the thought. Um, he didn't have the continuum. He didn't have um, thirdness at all. So his, his philosophy is riddled with dualism and therefore is incompatible. If you try to crack it open the Persian hammer, there are human parallels. There's like a, a Persian version of Hume, which is awesome. I love the Persian version of Hume. Hume is a great philosopher, but he didn't have thirdness. So it's just so much less rich than it could have been. Continuum yeah. is no longer considered uh, kind of a way, reality word. Work, both by physicists and also look at emphasis on combinatorial structures in uh, biology. Yeah. So that's that's the source of generativity. So uh, it, you are emphasizing continuum a lot. So continuum, I can see fitness uh, can lead to approximate continuum, but oh, uh, but it's not a continuum is not the way. If you want to say. Talk about cybernetics. Cybernetics is inherently theory of computation, everything, but it's about discreteness. And they would uh, computers by uh, any kind of con uh, continuum. So I'm saying that. Uh, well, I think it, it, there should be some way of saying that effectively you are you have a continuum, but the, uh, but the underlying fundamental reality you want to say it will is essentially discrete. So, no, yeah, so Perse would never say that. So I'm he would, he would that, never find it. So sense. I'm saying that uh, the modern uh, way science is uh, kind of uh, approaching biology, it's inherently discrete. So well, you are saying that uh, if I Perse is relevant, then uh, Perse might be relevant, but not in the country, uh, from the point of your emphasis on continuum. So. Right, right. So without that. Those are all great points you just made, and that's exactly right. Without an acknowledgement and acceptance of the continuum as a continuum, um, Christian thought just can't get going. And I take this to be, I like that you brought up, um, for me, in my mind, oversimplified, because I don't know enough about these, these research areas. Um, but the big divide, big divide, shouldn't be a big divide, but the big divide between kind of the AI world and computer scientists and more of the cybernetic world is, you know, in some sense, we might be going after the same, it's the same project, but the disciplinary break is, for me, the cybernetic side is accepting of a genuine continuum, more so than AI, which really wants to reduce to discreteness, which makes sense because computationally, is another way to say it, is reducing the computation. Secondness is very much computation. Thirdness, Growth, another poetic way to say this is that, you know, growth is infinitely, can be infinitely approximated to computation. But only through, this is where it gets subtle and complex, but only through thirdness itself. So, and Martin was asking him about this. I, I didn't realize this, that person was saying this for, for a very long time, but then the few moments I saw him saying it, Everything clicked. Everything, everything else that made no sense to me started to make sense to me, which is my my reason for taking it seriously. But um, my diagram that I I skipped over. So this this is kind of like a semiotic um, diagram or a biosemiotic diagram, and so we have firstness as firstness, which we can think of this as pure information, which is to say variety, okay, or maybe a, a kind of a closed system, strongly understood. So we have a firstness as firstness, we have a secondness as firstness, a thirdness as firstness, okay. So now we have the firstness of all of our three categories, which is always going to be in, in phenomena, um, 
ubiquitously for first. But then furthermore, we have a layer of secondness and secondness is themselves, namely the secondness of secondness, which serves as this relation between the firstness of firstness and the firstness of thirdness. Um, and then we also have thirdness as secondness, which is optimization. It's, go, it's because thirdness, by definition, brings firstness in line with secondness. But if firstness and secondness are both firstnesses, then this has to be thirdness as secondness. Um, so this, <laughs> so, so, no, it's, 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 it's complex, right? We're supposed to be getting the complexity. So it has to be complex in some way. Uh, but at the same time, it's simple because we're only thinking about the categories, which are simple. Um, so, um, and then thirdly, so we've got three kinds of firstnesses, two secondnesses, um, and then one thirdness because, you know, secondness can't be a thirdness, and firstness can't have a thirdness. Only thirdness itself can. So there's, there's another nesting in there. There's actually three dimensions of nesting that makes things even more complex, and I won't go into it. But this is a representation relation. Okay, so that, if we just take this, just trust me, and take this as a structure that is potentially helpful. The question, the immediate question is, if we treat this as a diagram and we're looking for more relations, is, well, look, I already drew this in. But what, in terms of categories, what does this realization represent? If we think about this, if we have a symmetry argument or think about it mathematically, this secondness to secondness projects from secondness to firstness. This thirdness to secondness projects from thirdness. So by a symmetry argument, this would be firstness as secondness. But we can't have firstness as secondness. That's just a blatant, that's like the most flagrant violation of this rule we're using, whereas we can't have a prior category being embodied by a more complex category. Um, so this, this is left open-ended. Um, but this is where the fractal structure, this is where um, what first calls infinite semiosis comes from. And this is actually, so this is like um, Derrida, for example, which takes, Derrida borrows from Persian semiotics, but he only borrows a part of it. He forgets, he forgets the rest of it. Derrida takes this itself, realization. Because this is infinite interpretation. This is interpretation upon interpretation, interpretation we can never get out of. It's the language we speak every day. But Peirce isn't Derrida. He, he has the foundation itself as well. This, this stream, the infinite stream, and if you zoom in, I try to draw it as its fractal nature. So to get from thirdness to secondness, which is a question we have on the table right now. So to get from the continuum to computation, from the continuum to discreteness, from organic life to computers. Um, since we can't have firstness to secondness, there's, this is like a perfect problem with person categories. We need to solve this problem. And the way per solves it is through thirdness itself. Um, which makes sense. If you think about it, if you have a topological continuum, which is, for Peirce, it's no longer set theory. We, we can't have a Cantor's infinite set of points because there's still points at the end of the day. The points themselves have to merge and blend into each other. That's the real, that's the real continuum that Peirce is after, which is why he wants to say topology itself primitively as its own area of, of respectable mathematics. But to get from that, perfectly smooth continuum to discreteness, to the bits of computation, the only way that makes sense is, is a continuous approximation. So we have to use continuity itself to approximate the discrete, which is to say we have to use thirdness. But <laughs> the reason why this causes an infinite fractal chain of interpretations upon interpretations is because this thirdness has to branch as thirdness. Um, and therefore, once you branch to a thirdness and secondness, you have thirdness again, so you've got a branch. And uh, one way to think about this, this seems all vague and poetic, the way I'm saying it, but this is actually rigorously understood in logic. If any of you are familiar with logic, um, 
with the proofs as programs paradigm. So proofs as pure mathematical proof represent a continuous chain of reasoning. For first, especially, this is actually very much representative of thirdness. But we often want to get the algorithmic content out of a proof. That's the whole proofs as um, programs paradigm. And, and actually, I think this is starting to happen in, with um, genetic algorithms and stuff. I, I know very little of that. Uh, but I think it's starting to happen. But anyway, this is a very practical problem. We're trying to get algorithmic content out of what is otherwise a pure proof. And the way we do that, Cleaney, the logician Cleaney discovered this, is, well, we come up with these schemata, these schemes, that says, um, OK, if we have this witness as an object, which is to say a, a bit of data, that will show that the proof goes through. But then, by the way, we also have to prove that we have that witness. So we get this branching, this branching phenomenon. And you can see right away that this has to go on ad infinitum. And on an everyday life, a computer scientist is going to cut it off at some point, of course, and say, oh, that's good enough. That's my program. Um, but technically, since this is thirdness, this has to be, and this is what we do in language, we have to infinitely interpret each other constantly over and over. It's never going to end. But if we zoom out, we also know that we can recalibrate ourselves and look for, have some surprising information again to refocus us, think of a new object, and then go through the cycle again. But no matter what, when we try to realize, since this can't be, this is just missing from our picture. It, it screams at us to be first and second, but that would, that would um, destroy the, the categories. Yeah. <clears throat> On, you know, what you were just talking about, about how it has the fractal infinite branching of between secondness and thirdness. Yeah. Uh, in mathematics, you can take an infinite sum and approximate it as a, as a very precise equation. Can you not do the same thing with the with, with an infinite branching of secondness and thirdness? Is, is well, the problem, some kind of the problem with that is that those sum, that's, that's a great um, thought there. But the problem with that, arithmetical sums and geometric sums, we're still in the realm of discrete in many ways. That's, that we're not starting from the topological continuum mm -hmm. that first wants to start from. So yeah, we, if, we don't, if we don't have the full continuum, we can, in finite time, reduce quasi-continuum to just pure discreteness. Um, Hirsch would be OK with that. But he would say, look, you didn't start with a continuum. So if you really start with a continuum, then it's going to take an infinite uh, process to, to really get the, the correct computation out of it. Yeah. Um, just just uh, a little. A little. Dimly related, at least, in terms of the of the AI to discreteness, yeah, uh, continuous thing. If you look at AI in in a sensory environment or or particular for robots or, or things like those, right, you have to deal with your 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 you're not rejecting the notion of a, a continuous world. Uh, your environment and maybe even some black boxes that you use for for predictions yeah. are you can think of as continuous things. But all of your internal inputs and all of your internal productions are are discrete uh, typically, and so you, you you have this interaction with the continuous world, which maybe relates to one of those areas, mm. and to some extent that. Uh, the, the, the recursion that you're showing there, a lot of times that's temporal. You know, right. you, 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 you figure out where you, where you must be, you read it in the world, you predict where you, you know where you want to go, you figure out how to get there, you try to get there, and then you check to see whether you really got where you wanted to go and you didn't. Right. So you correct. But that correction is, is you use a, a transducer to the, to the continuous world to see where you really where so so there's there's a kind of a a regular interaction between your internal discrete world right. and that continuous environment that, that you're, you found yourself in. I don't know if it connects well with that at all. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds 
um, very similar, definitely, yeah. And person would say, like, the optimal form of that interface would be continuous interface. Like, if we think of continuous focusing, if you're, if you're a photographer, um, and this is, this is the paradox built into this, too, because continuous focusing has the greatest potential to get to your maximally focused and discretized objects. Um, but at the same time, since it's continuous, you, you're never going to quite get there um, because you need that cutoff point itself. And in, in, in a way, that kind of continuous focus mechanism is what I was talking about as a black box. You might, right. you might have, have that continuous entity that you that you use, but yes, you read it out at a, at a, at a fixed time, and you read maybe your focused image uh, in, in a discrete way. Right. And you may not let it evolve some more, and then look and get it again to see if anything changed. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that example. It feels yeah. like uh, the continuum program is not pragmatic enough. That seems like the problem is that the Discrete allows for uh, tractable solutions. That's the reason uh, computational complexity, whatever people talk about, NP completeness, log space things, all those things are. I I always thought it was kind of a, true in the spirit of pragmatic way of what is possible and what is knowable and so on. Right. So I'm saying so discrete mathematical structures, especially in category theory, the whole body of work is okay. They, uh, French mathematicians wanted to generate the reals, the complex, from just the discrete. And that is what uh, Graph and Dick and everybody did for uh, two, three cent centuries. So I'm saying that the continuum, uh, it seems uh, too, uh, it's not pragmatic, it's not constructive enough. I don't see why we need the uh, I, continuum. Yeah, like, well, like discrete, uh, is, from discrete you can, uh, you can continuum makes sense. But, uh, Continuum, uh, I can see there's an approximation and only an approximation. Mm. I, like, what is missing? Topology I, is kind of uh, any which way you see categorically or you, even if you use operator theory, everything you can from start with discrete and go to the uh, continuum. And same with a lot of uh, mathematical biology, start with discrete and go to the uh, continuum. So, yeah, so I can see it like it's useful, it's like dual, but I don't want to put primary emphasis on. Uh, continuum. All right. I don't see any well, reason well, why it should be equally important and prominent for sure. Uh, it should, uh, and I definitely i i i take the the point about the practicality of uh, concreteness and discreteness, and Peirce would fully accept that. It's just a matter of getting there. Is in, in, in the two examples you mentioned too. Um, first of all, Grothendieck is a full-on person. I would leave him out of your list just now. Um, he, more than any of the mathematicians the past 50 years, has really embraced the continuum. Um, like the, the, you know, the topos theory of category, which I don't understand. Um, one thing that that does is it, it starts with the continuum. It doesn't start with set theory and, and build out. Okay, I'm, I'm talking with uh, Rothendieck before he became a dubious mental. Thing. Uh, like that's no, the thing. Before, before, before he even became psychotic. I think, yeah. think uh, Topos came when he was uh, a goat herder in the 90s and late yeah. 80s. I'm talking about Rothenbeek, who kind of established a French school which solved the wise conjectures and kind of, kind of over, outright overnight said, okay, category where is the way of the thinking about mathematics. So I don't know about the other one. It's just like people like it because uh, it's after Rothenbeek's uh, child. But I, I don't know whether it's uh, uh, fragment. But anyway, I think yeah. that's a, a side that's peripheral to what we are discussing. Right, right. Um, uh, and well, just to go back to before the Grothnik time of mathematics with set theory and Cantor, that was actually happening during Peirce's life too. And Peirce wrote letters to Cantor, which he never got responses um, from. <laughs> he, that often happens at first. Um, <laughs> but uh, he loved the new set theory when it was first happening. He thought Cantor was an absolute genius. He thought it would revolutionize math, which apparently it did. And um, 
then at the turn of the 20th century, you know, he had this this huge topological turn, and he convinced himself. So Aleph won all the infinite cardinalities um, aren't good enough for verse. And ultimately, what that comes down to is because they're still quantitative. They still have a cardinality. Like for first, the, the real, the true continuum, um, you know, abstracts from quantity itself. It's just, um, it's just form. Yeah. So uh, he, yeah, like he he liked the the discreteness of set theory, and he thought he could build up more, more and more infinitely full sets that were kind of less and less discrete in some sense, um, but it's still too discrete for verse. You know, well, I'll start with this uh, kind, of, kind of example. The computer scientists, when they started discrete, everybody liked the continuum. So they try to do continuous time computation, right. real time computation, yeah. uh, kind of computation using partial differential equation. All of them failed because they it was just not practical. If you want yeah, to because it's build a, if you want to build a real time computation, if you want to do anything in real space, yeah. they showed that you need infinite energy, they need infinite and so it's not pra practical. Uh, kind of, it's not possible in the physical universe. Uh, in it, the continuum is not possible in the physical universe. I think before the yeah. digital computers, before there was discrete computation, yeah. even in my lifetime there were analog computers. And I actually done or, or had dealings with analog computation. Right. Uh, so so analog computation is possible. And and part of the reason why cybernetics cybernetics must have been influenced by all these analog uh, computer. I mean I can't show this, but I don't know this, but but it seems like cybernetics started at an at an analog time, at a time when things were not yet digital. So it it kept that tradition. Yeah, but in yeah. any case, there are analog computers. Yeah, because the general results, when they say like how much a powerful, how much of a powerful computer you can build, people say, oh, it's like uh, you need more than the energy of the universe to do something these numbers. But I mean, are we saying something like you, like if you're going to try to, like the way we act may be coming from a continuous way. So if you're going to like, yeah. solve consciousness, you you can't do it. Right. Discreetly, so like whether or not, so I mean, I would say like, all right, we don't have, we don't know how these relate in like a usable way for computation because that seems kind of like you can't really go from a continuum and work in like binary language. But if the way we actually think and the way that our minds actually work somehow did come from a continuum, there would be no way to solve that with um, with discrete. Like that's the use of it. It is to find out how do you get from that because you know if you're going from the idea that that is actually how we think then and we don't actually think like zeros and ones I'm just saying like that's why you would I mean as a computer scientist like I don't know what you can do with it but um, but that that's sort of what I was thinking anyway. definitely yeah um, yeah and I, I just I was reading a book the other day and I guess they're calling you just perfectly summarized in the literature they're calling it the, the first tome argument now for the reality that it's you if, if there's experience, conscious experience to any degree, um, then th there must be a, a primitive continuum because you can't generate a pure uh, continuous stream from any form of, of discreteness. So you can't get an irra irrational number from discreteness, right? Yeah, but that is there that dedicated computation which shows you can say that we need it. Get it as close as, as, close as you want. Uh, uh, want uh, so it's a abstract. It's a, it's kind of an asymptotic in limit that right. exists uh, real number. Which which is why this becomes yeah it becomes non quantitative for first topological continuum. And like in terms of number systems, the closest thing we have, like Chaitin's uh, random numbers, like Chaitin's random numbers. We literally, you know, you literally can't pinpoint them. Yeah. It's as if they're moving, right? Yeah, they're not computable. So that, right? Exactly, not computable, which is to say, oh not. Yeah, yeah. So I think if we're going to talk about number systems, I think Chaitin's random numbers, so Omega and stuff, that would be, that would satisfy satisfy first the most. Um, what about formalisms that tie together 
discreteness and continuum, like Combs Quebec. Yeah, exactly. Bifurcations in general. Right. You have both. You have, and there, discreteness, you could argue, is emergent from the continuum. So that reverses the relation, right? Right. Uh, so it's like uh, I'm saying that it's together it is it, good, but I'm saying that well, to put uh, primary status to continue to, gen to that generating. If secondness is discreteness and thirdness is continuum, then there's some way in which this uh, is logically prior to continuum, and maybe you, know, you could argue uh, that maybe continuum is logically prior to discreteness in the sense that continuous formal systems can generate discreteness. Right, and we can uh, go both ways. If we change aspects, yeah. we could go both ways because first we'd want to say discreteness would be logically prior to thirdness. But experientially, in terms of the phenomenon of the world, the continuum comes first because we have to abstract from thirdness. Yeah. And so you get this two-way interaction first that people often forget about because we have to, you know, as scientists, we start with thirdness. We're always swimming in a sea of thirdness, Chris likes to say. Um, and then through abstraction, our powers, our magical powers of abstraction, we get to secondness and firstness. Um, but then when we're doing, we're starting from the pure realm of thought and we're doing logic, for example, um, then we build up definitionally from first and second and thirdness. So we could actually go both ways as long as we know what we're doing, <laughs> what aspect we're in. If we're thinking definitionally, logically, or if we're thinking, you know, uh, empirically. So maybe if it's uh, more of a, if you have phenomenal as the philosopher, you feel continuum should be prior. Should, should be prior and uh, if you think that both phenomenology and also the other way of thinking is necessary, then you should be able to have some way of equal. Yeah, equal. Yeah. And you both both are necessary or something. Yeah. In in some sense, you know, continuum is, is prior to this because there's a very finite process to going from from you know a continuum to to a, a discrete thing, threshold or any number of extremely fast uh, uh, direct procedures and you described this infinitely complex procedure for trying to get to an arbitrary continuous thing with a sequence of, of elements never of which none of which and in fact even if you stop the, the sequence after a billion turns you're still not there and you don't know how to proceed unless you have the rule that you're using to generate so even that huge sequence didn't get you anywhere towards getting to the continuum. So, so you could, if, if you wanted to, I, you know, I don't care about priority and stuff, but but you could easily look at it the other way. Right, I think. So you were, let's say, to be a devil's advocate. Yeah, please. Uh, so here's this very abstract scheme for right. the second and third in this, and um, and it's. It's very high up in the abstraction, right? And so, and I would agree that things that are very abstract aren't falsifiable, aren't subject to a barbarian. That is, you can't demand that they be falsifiable. You can only yeah. you can only ask that they be generative, and what they're what they generate ultimately ought to be falsifiable. But but how would you uh, can't what? It's like pre-scientific thought were, were, was full of parallelisms, you know, like traditional uh, uh, European thought and, and Asian thought, you know, had, had isomorphisms of this kind, and yet, you know, basically we feel that they weren't good enough, they, they were arbitrary in some way. Right. So, so I can't escape the feeling that how do you defend this against being arbitrary in some way other than just it's very generative and it's useful people uh, the what's the test of it what's the so hard if I'm, um first first would say first would respond to you um by actually taking fallibilism so the, the 
that's of science? That's secondness. Is that right? Well, fallibilism is secondness. Is oh uh, no no it's it's thirdness. It's thirdness. Yeah. Oh. It, there's there are times when the first oh. says fallibilism is uh, thirdness objectified, and and various other uh, phrases oh. he uses. But the thing I was going to highlight is this kind of Popperian idea, that even though Popper's version is not as good as Kirst's, but that idea of falsifiability for science mm -hmm. applies uniformly to the whole system for Kirst, um, which is quite a tough pill to swallow, because if you apply that everywhere, what Kirst is saying, and, and I guess you don't want, want to say, and plenty of people don't want to say, it, is that even the so-called truisms of mathematics are potentially falsifiable. Are empirical? Yeah. So that's that's the uniformity of Peirce's thought. It's Peirce's idea was taking the scientific method and applying it uniformly throughout all of the inquiry. So like uh, one of his first articles in, in which was actually published in Popular Science Monthly for some weird reason. Um, he goes through the go-to methods of inquiry um, throughout history and. The last method, and the most important, and the one he thinks we should stick with, of course, is the scientific method. Um, but he takes it so seriously that he applies it to all of thought. So, like before, you've got Kant using like a priori arguments and stuff like that, and you've got he calls this the first one tenacity. Just you're stubborn. You just keep ideology. Yeah, first, ideology. second, third. Yeah, ideology. Okay. Uh, so that's like the most primitive method we ever came up with, uh, which can work, I guess. <laughs> Politically, and uh, what's what am I missing? What's here? Method of tenacity. Uh, oh, authority. Right. Forgot the medieval, medieval times. <laughs> That's more like the uh, religion, you know. No. The, uh, well, pope, the pope said so. So it's gotta be. Um, but the just one thing. The, the, the way this sounds completely strange and foreign, and it should because it is, but the way Hearst ends up applying the scientific, which is to say empirical method, to everything goes back to what I was talking about with the diagram, which I said very quickly and very poorly. But the idea is anything we study has to be externally manifested, has to be empirically manipulable. Even pure mathematics itself, of course, is not just some mystical mental gain that we in some sense don't have access to. Um, we, just as we do in science, but in a more simple way, because we don't need all the extravagant instrumentation, we have a diagram, for example, in front of us, and we manipulate it literally physically. Could we demonstrate that some use of this way of thinking yeah. is wrong? Right, yeah, so the humility, the, the modesty of Peirce's thought is false, but falsifiability itself applies to everything, including the system of categories themselves. Is, um, is it, and the person is the first to say this. He's like, well, these are the ones that are very prominent to me, and I see all the time. Um, but he oh, he's open to the idea of them being, A, not the, the universal ones to, to begin with, and either being more. Uh, he's not very open to there being less in some sense, um, but that's just more tenacity than anything. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of what what he thought of the falsifiability right. there, there certainly are some extremely complex proofs in mathematics and yeah. in computer science. Yeah. There are as to what a program does, which are far more complicated than the programs themselves. And so it, it's, it's not at all unusual to have someone come up with a proof, a complicated proof, and have that be shown to be wrong years or, or right. even many years later. Right. That, but but with, by the same basic techniques that the proof that the prover used, hmm. um, nothing. The, they wouldn't find anything amazing. Maybe the a new theorem is around, but but they'd be using the same process. They right. wouldn't be using something explicitly representational or or or, or, or manifest maybe to show the the, the the mathematical proof to be wrong. Well, um, is that I know good enough, or does he want to see some kind of manifest contradiction to it? 
he, I mean, first of all, truth and belief and acceptance, all of these ideas, another aspect of prayer is those are robustly social. So even the mathematician, um, he thinks the mathematician is less, doesn't have to hold as strong to this as the scientist, but even the mathematician first would say, you know, his theorem, Fermat's theorem, whatever theorem, he proves that he's satisfied with it. His supervisor is satisfied with it. The computer is satisfied with it. Um, it's still not deemed to be accepted and true and have all these honorific things we say until the, the, the community itself adopts it. Um, and so in, in philosophy, one thing where Peirce has talked about a lot, even though it's like one thing he wrote about the least, is theory of truth uh, and epistemology and stuff. Because the Persian theory of truth is, uh, in a slogan, truth is what the ideal community of inquirers would come to in the infinitely extended future. Uh, or were we to stay focused and keep asking our scientific questions? Um, so he's like he takes fallible to a whole new heights. Um, but it's not like paralyzing skepticism because we can still make progress. Um, yeah, these things get complex. Um, but like I only gave you um, kind of the blueprint of Perse, and all the details of it uh, are all interrelated and support each other. But most of them, 80% of it is completely new, a completely new thesis that almost no one has ever thought of before. What would Perse think of uh, computer simulation? Uh, oh, he loved it, yeah. Loved the whole computer revolution uh, which, by the way, he was the first to come up with um, digital switching circuits in his logic notebook. Uh, but you never mentioned according Herbert, to Wikipedia. Yeah. But you never mentioned Herbert Simon uh, as being indirectly or directly disciple of Peirce. Uh, of Peirce. So that's, uh, what was he? I didn't know he was. Or no, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. Like just, uh, Herbert Simon seems similar. Like, uh, it's kind of intellectual child or something. Uh, way right, of right. But uh, of course, Herbert Simon kind of disowned gender system theory in several interviews. But uh, but at least he, he who should be considered system scientist. Or yeah, system just theory. before producing it, yeah. uh, he disowned it before contributing to it. Uh, okay, Simon, I should look into that. That's okay. Well, he was a polymath, you know, right. in, in kind of the style. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so would, okay, just to follow the would he would he say that okay, I can I want to visualize it, so that's one way of thinking about my pure math. So would he also kind of uh, embrace I want to be able to simulate it or kind of, I will trust this machine that exists in the real world to make my uh, uh, mathematical reasoning uh, more powerful? Do you accept this? Yes, I'm thinking now. I've never thought about this topic. This is great. Um, like, you know, how, how Perse would react to our current technological state. And I'm actually, I just felt a reservation in me thinking that if we're doing philosophy, I think Perse would be gung ho about computer simulation, which is what happens in systems theory often. So he, I think he'd be very supportive of that. But because well, once again, we're doing we're in the realm of secondness, right? We're looking at positive, common phenomena, so we can look at that on the computer screen and, and get data from that. First, we definitely support that. But I just had this feeling, thinking when it comes to doing pure math, we definitely can, because it's it's the creativity. It's the um, I don't want this to spill into what other philosophers say because it's easy to do that. It's tough to keep it together, but. It's the creative act of the mathematician itself. It's this productiveness, the, the generated potential. So it's actually the act of adding the new relation in your diagram or whatever. That is the mathematics. So computer simulation as a kind of externalized, but at the same time kind of passive thing, first would be quite skeptical of the computer work that is happening in mathematics, um, like proof theorems or or simulations in math and stuff like that. I think if someone was trying to do pure math, he, he would be really skeptical of that. 
Um, but then we take it up a notch and we, we do philosophy, you'd be like, oh yeah, sure. Because now we're looking at forever. We're just looking at more of first, second, and thirdness. It doesn't matter where it is. Yeah. Okay. But I think. <laughs> I'm, gu I'm guessing what he might. Yeah. Yeah.